coming. Um, uh, I want to welcome you to this panel on uh, the banality of evil. Uh, this is sponsored by the Hunt Aron Center and the Human Rights Project. And um, we welcome you here. Uh, we have six wonderful and distinguished panelists today. Uh, I'm not going to, I, I sent an email around that, that lists some of their publications and other interesting things about them. I'm just going to remind you of who they are. Uh, Lori Naranch, who teaches at Siena College in, near Albany. Uh, Jakob Rensdorf, who teaches at Roskilde University in Denmark. And we welcome him. He's been using the Arendt Library today. Uh, had a good experience there. Artyom Magoon, who teaches at Smolny and St. Peter's University. Uh, Lori Marso, who teaches at Union College. Robin Morosco, who teaches at Williams College. And Asma Abbas, who teaches at Simon's Rock. Um, let me just uh, give a very quick explanation and introduction about what the panel is and what I've asked people to do. Uh, as many of you know, um, the word banality of evil, which is on the book title of Hannah Arendt, was not part of the original New Yorker series or the original book title. It only appears once in the book on page 252, the last page of the book before the epilogue. Um, and I'll just read the, the short sentence in which it appears, so we have it in front of us. It was as though in those last minutes he, namely Eichmann, was summing up the lesson that this long course in human wickedness had taught us, the lesson of the fearsome word and thought defined banality of evil. So, um, what this means has garnered an enormous amount of attention. attention. Uh, I've asked all these uh, panelists today, who are all people who thought about Arendt in some way or another, but none of whom I would classify as Arendt scholars, which I think is an advantage. Uh, they come at it fresh. Uh, neither am I an Arendt scholar. Um, to talk for five to seven minutes, and one of the things I did is I gave them four short essays to read that are going to be published in a book uh, coming out later this year called Thinking in Dark Times, which is a collection of essays based on the conference that we had here at Bard two years ago for RN's 100th birthday. And um, not all of you have, they've all now read these four essays. That doesn't mean they're going to write on them or speak on them, but they have that in the background. And let me at least give you a one or two sentence quick summary of what these four essays were about. So um, one, by someone named Roger Berkowitz, um, <laughs> suggests that um, evil, and the character of evil in Arendt is thoughtlessness, and that the question that drives her work has to do with thinking, and specifically what the article tries to argue is that she understands thinking in opposition to and against reasoning, and reason, and suggests that there's thus a connection between the banality of evil and the rise of reason in um, modern society, or another word for reason would be science, and some of you will know my interest in it. Um, another article by Jennifer Colbert, who teaches at Johns Hopkins, um, argues that the judges in the Eichmann trial did not think. And that, again, thoughtlessness is, she argues as well, uh, at the essence of the banality of evil. And she says that Arendt's book challenges, that says that the judges did not think, by which she means that the judges did not challenge the received wisdom of the rule of law, namely that all bad acts are to be judged under laws. There's some seats up here for those who would like them. Um, so for Colbert, there's this idea that the, um, the judges didn't challenge the rule of law, and that Eichmann was a case that needed to be thought outside of legal thinking and outside of the rule of law. Uh, the third article was by Richard Bernstein, who some of you might know. He teaches the New School and uh, is a, a well-known Arendt scholar. He argues that the question of, and, and asking about the banality of evil is a bad idea. The banality of evil, he says, is not that important in Arendt. Um, and in a sense, uh, there was no theory in Arendt's work of the banality of evil. It's been made too much of. It appears once in the book. It wasn't a big thing for her. It wasn't in the title, and people made way too much of it, and if anything, it's now become a cliche, and we should sort of drop it. Um, and then the fourth one was by Yaron Izrahi, 
who uh, teaches at um, uh, Hebrew University in Jerusalem, who uh, basically argues that maybe it was a cliché then, and maybe it is a cliché, but cliché or not, it's taken on a life of its own, and there's a second life to it that has nothing to do with what a rent meant by it. And that we should pay attention to that aspect of the banality of evil. And he says, in that sense, the banality of evil can be quite useful today in the world, in places like Israel, which is the example he uses, because the banality of evil says evil is banal. And what it allows people to do is when they disagree, when they hate each other, when they say you're evil, they can say actually, well, you're not so evil, you're not radically evil, and we can actually talk to one another. And so for um, Ezrahi, the banality of evil actually is politically useful, forgetting what Arendt meant by it. Anyway, these are four different approaches to thinking about the banality of evil that were um, represented in the conference that we had, that are going to be in this book. I don't know if any of these people are going to talk about them, but I, I, I put them out there for them to, to, to consider. And, uh, and now I'm going to let them begin. We're going to go this way. So Lori Naranj from Siena College is going to begin. Uh, first, can people hear me in the back, or should I show you some microphone? Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, so first of all, let me thank Professor Berkowitz for the opportunity to engage in this dialogue uh, with the work of Hannah Arendt, in particular, the banality of evil thesis. Uh, I do appreciate, as Roger rightly says, that Arendt helps us to think in dark times, and I would add, perhaps even to act. Um, However, uh, despite my, my own appreciation for Arendt's work on political practice, judgment, and thinking, I want to play the gadfly in looking at the banality of evil thesis. In particular, I wonder if it is both too specific and interpreted too broadly to do the work of diagnosing and accounting for political evil in non-totalitarian states at the moment. Uh, Secondly, uh, I will put out a plea generally to political theorists interested in political evil to continue to diagnose the banality of evil, but also to explore a more complex language of violation, vice, and responsibility in the context of a democracy. Uh, by democracy, I mean here simply uh, being understood as having an equal right to participate in making public judgments about the exercise of collective power. As Richard Bernstein points out in an article uh, Professor Berkowitz just summarized, Arendt doesn't offer a theory of the banality of evil, and I'm sympathetic with that view. She uses this phrase to narrate or to make sense of the ways in which Adolf Eichmann is guilty of the charges against him, since he does not appear to have an intent to do evil through a hatred of Jews, but rather does great evil by his very ordinary and normal desire to climb the ranks of the Nazi party and to follow the law. That is, Eichmann is guilty of crimes against humanity, a new and terrifying category of crime made possible by technological innovations in mass society because of his inability to think otherwise, which might have allowed him to do otherwise than transport Jews to their deaths. That sheer thoughtlessness is the cause of such, uh, quote, thought and word-defying banality of evil. And it is incredibly terrifying, as Arendt lays it out to us. Therefore, unlike Peter Bear, I don't find the phrase to be silly cleverness. But then again, I'm not approaching this from a theological perspective, although I know good and evil have deep roots there. The phrase has been so potent, I think, because so recognizable and so terrifying for just the reason Arendt details. But Arendt's attention to this phenomenon is tied to the novelty of totalitarianism as a new form of government. Therefore, it is quite specific to the time and space of totalitarianism and the deeds of Eichmann. Arendt is usefully specific, giving us understanding into how terrible evil is done on such a massive scale, forcing us to avoid the comfort of seeing this evil as simply the work of pathological monsters. That Arendt risks and does provide Eichmann with a recognition of his humanity as an individual, middle-aged, de facto stateless son of so-and-so, counters the ways in which he is so unworlded that he can't distinguish right and wrong under the Nazi regime. But Eichmann isn't only her focus in the report on the banality of evil. Arendt is also interested in documenting other violations of law, 
Israel's kidnapping of Eichmann, the actions of groups and individuals, her discussions of the Jewish councils and resistors in both Holland and Denmark, as a way to return the world to her readers and fellow citizens. I don't think she collapses these actions into the banality of evil framework, but there is some controversy there. Therefore, the banality of evil narrative relates to Eichmann in particular, or someone like him, and to how this individual can appear on the world stage where common sense has been abandoned to logicality and ideology. In the origins of totalitarianism, where Arendt writes about the experience of totalitarianism uh, more generally, uh, she suggests that isolation, being separated from others, and loneliness, being alone without myself, without an inability to think or know myself, are the experiences writ large for perpetrators, witnesses, and victims in totalitarianism. The banality of evil is one piece of this broader experience. <coughs> Although, as Arendt notes, totalitarianism can never be total, uh, there will always be new people in the world, or as she says, quote, Politically speaking, it is under conditions of terror that most people will comply, but some people will not, just as the lessons of the countries to which the final solution was proposed is that it could happen in most places, but it did not happen everywhere. Can the banality of thesis be adequately applied, then, to non-totalitarian states? Perhaps uh, moral blindness or bureaucratic evil or narcissistic nihilism or ordinary vices is more appropriate for capturing the harms of intentional and non-intentional complicity in contemporary security states. On the other hand, the idea that the banality of evil thesis means that there is, quote, a potential Eichmann in all of us threatens to erase the specificity of the individual and the context of political action, and to assume, as Arendt mentions, that these horrors could happen anywhere. If we assume that, we risk erasing the risk of politics and individual responsibility. This very broad interpretation of the banality of evil threatens to downplay the moral, political, and legal judgment Arendt renders in her commentary on Eichmann's trial. For example, in relation to the revelations of torture at Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo, some editorialize that we are all torturers now, we Americans. Timothy Kaufman Osborne argues that this claim misses the new state situation of a security state and it depoliticizes who is indeed guilty and how. If all are torturers, none can be in particular. For Kaufman Osborne, we need a new diagnosis of how within liberalism of the United States, which classically seeks to erect barriers to unlimited power through law and through the distinguishing between the time of normalcy and the state of exception, uh, how uh, we have a new state formation of security which threatens those borders or has collapsed some of those divisions. Here, both Kaufman Osborne and Iris Marion Young argue for a supplement to a legal liability model, who did what or who helped whom, with a model of complicitous accountability or a social connection model to tie democratic citizens into a politically engaged kind of accountability for violations of the rule of law, fair treatment of prisoners, indefinite, uh, indefinite detentions, and so on. This leads me to this suggestion I think political theorists could use a richer vocabulary of political evil than the radical or the banal. Like Arendt, we should be willing to take our guides from living experience. Arendt can offer some guideposts here in terms of making judgments about seeing the banality of evil, but this must be contextually specified and tied to particular deeds and experiences. Certainly, politics taps into its share of ordinary vices, lying, hypocrisy, corruption, and it often seems to require dirty hands for which there may or may not be legal sanction and punishment or adequate forms of responsibility. Couldn't we usefully add to our vocabulary of political evil or cruelty more attention to these ordinary vices as well as the extraordinary form of evil and radical and banal appearances? However, it's hard to shake the, rec that the recognition that the phenomenon of banality of evil is especially potent in producing meaning about how particular human bodies are rendered disposable on the part of state authorities or by those in positions of power over others. For example, it strikes me as plausible that we could argue that John Yu's actions drafting the so-called torture memo is an example of the banality of evil, although some may say it's just plain evil or just plain necessary. 
certainly there must be some culpability for justifying the violation of constitutional, military, and international law for fair treatment of detainees in the war on terror. Or to take a popular culture example, uh, the character of Senior Juan in the film Dirty Pretty Things. Anyone seen it? Uh, Senior Juan is a businessman uh, managing a hotel in London in which he employs uh, many undocumented workers. He also runs a trade in illegal human organs coerced from those without legal protections from this hotel. He certainly sees human beings as disposable workers and bodies, but this doesn't appear to be out of any malice or intention to target certain human beings other than the weak or the vulnerable. He wants to make money, maybe he savors the control he exercises, he doesn't think of others, he's not reflected himself, instead he appears as remarkably thoughtless. If this is the banality of evil, then we will be able to make some sense of his actions and condemn them. But to understand the system more broadly, we should pay attention to how the business of transnational exchanges in neoliberal or economic systems renders many persons without legal protection because they don't have access to civil protections or citizenship rights. The banality of evil phenomena can capture some of the ways we render others superfluous, but it also requires a great deal more in terms of theorizing liberalism now. It requires also thinking about ordinary vices and formulations of responsibility beyond mere liability to counter how dehumanization, this unworlding of ourselves and others, continues on the part of policymakers and ordinary citizens. Thank you.